Hey everyone, welcome back to Underreported Stories, where we cover the news that CNN, MSNBC, and Fox News fail to report on, or just don't report on enough. You guys, something crazy happened over the weekend. Y'all, I watched the Barbie movie for the first time ever. I know, it was like such a height of political commentary last summer, I just had wanted actually nothing to do with it. And so I was on my way home from Laguna Beach this past weekend and I decided to watch it. And I'm going to be honest, I really anticipated that I'd like it and then be really embarrassed for liking it because I'm a girly girl. I really love, like some of my favorite movies are like Legally Blonde and Borat, which sounds really crazy, but like I love really dumb, stupid movies that are like funny, maybe a little sad like in Legally Blonde. But overall, those are my favorite types of movies, just kind of dumb, thoughtless movies. They're my favorite. And so I just anticipated that a dumb, thoughtless movie about, you know, a Barbie doll would be something that I would actually like. And then I would have to get on here and be like, you guys, I kind of liked the Barbie movie. That is not actually what happened, though. I hated this movie. I thought it was awful. And like, take it from the political innuendo standpoint, standpoint. No one talks the way that any of the characters talk in the movie where they're just like constantly saying, you're a a white cisgender fascist, whatever. Just the constant use of political words. That's not how people talk. It was weird. I didn't like it. The way they kept bringing up the word patriarchy. I'm like, no one talks about that. No one thinks like that. It was just only someone in Hollywood whose brain operates entirely along those lines thinks about it just was weird and then okay put the political innuendos aside the plot line was shit too it didn't make any sense Ken goes in and they go out and I kind of thought it would be one of those things like Elf you know where where it all takes place in one one realm and then they come back to another realm. it was just back and forth you know it was just a mess if you guys have not seen it don't waste your time It, it just wasn't any good but Anyway, you guys can always rely on getting a take from me, but just might take a year plus to get it. Um, so that's good. I'm glad I saw it. I guess I glad, I'm glad I finally got it out of the way and in a pointless pe- period of my life, right? Just sitting on the plane. Had nothing to do anyway. But something that's not pointless um, is the Story Seekers group. Y'all, if you are not a part of the Story Seekers group, it is awesome. It is my Instagram broadcast channel. So if you go to my Instagram, which you can in the show notes, you can join the Story Seekers group. It's completely free. And then every Tuesday and Thursday when I post the podcast, I will just post something to elicit questions from you guys, hear what you guys want me to talk about on the podcast, etc. And so I had a question from... Jerry Garcia that says, can you chat about your wedding plans and how much it costs these days? You guys, I'm 18 freaking days away from my wedding and it has cost me my left arm and all of my sanity. I literally lay lay awake at night thinking like, oh my God, what could go wrong on this day? And it's supposed to be such a joyous day and I get that. I really do. I think it will be such a joyous day. But holy shit, it brings me so much anxiety and just it takes so much time and it costs so much money. And all I want is a house. And here I am having a wedding. It's one of those things where people always ask me like, oh, well, why don't you just elope? There's a lot of pressure on you to have a wedding, too. And not that my in-laws or soon to be in-laws or my parents wouldn't be totally cool if I wanted to elope, I guess. But I think my little sister is more of the elope style girl and my fiance's little brother is also more of the elope style guy and so both Jake my fiance and I very much felt like this might be the only wedding that our family does so we felt not pressure we definitely wanted to do it but we do feel like with each decision we make we're like well it's gonna be the only one might as well go balls to the wall and we've just spent maybe a little bit more than we (laughs) tend to do um I will say We have been so, so fortunate. I can't even imagine how much other people spend on their wedding. I was just in this beautiful wedding in Laguna Beach, and I was like, I can't even fathom how much this costs. But our wedding, I will say we've done a pretty good job of cutting costs where we can. We've been really blessed, really fortunate that a lot of very talented people go to our church and do all of their very talented things at a discounted rate for us. So (laughs) although we, we were very kind and we returned the favor, but it's just, wow, we are very, very blessed. So Jerry... That is the update on my wedding planning. 18 days 
and I just can't, I can't wait for it. I can't, I truly can't guys. But if you are interested in, you know, dropping comments, being part of our community, not only can you drop emojis in the comments so that I respond to you at the end of the show, but also you can join our story seekers group and that way we can have constant communication. I'm definitely getting to know the group and it's been real fun. But without further ado, let's get into our docket. So our docket for today, we have the state of Florida arresting an 11-year-old boy and then perp walking him. People have very strong opinions and very strong feelings about the public arrest of a child. So we will get into that. We also have a new story out of Springfield, Ohio. No animal consumption stories in this, just cold, hard facts debunking a lot of the media's claims, which will be really fun. And speaking of media debunking, we're living in an alternate universe because CNN is actually doing its job and released a brutal fact check on Kamala Harris's campaign X account. So that will also be quite interesting. So let's get into the five underreported stories that you need to know. Like I said, we're teeing this off with the first story. It's about an 11 year old boy who was arrested perp walked and then thrown in jail after bragging about a list, a list of people he wanted to, uh, 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 if you get what I'm saying, listening audience. And this child also showed off an arsenal of weapons that he had, how an 11 year old got an arsenal of weapons. The size that I will show you is just astounding. This kid's name is Carlo Kingston Dorelli. He's 11 years old and he showed his I'm going to call them pew-pews. You know what I mean. He showed his pew-pews to his classmates and reportedly threatened to commit a mass pew-pewing at multiple different school locations. So the Volusia, this is Volusia, Florida Sheriff's Department. So this is the county where this all took place. They put out information about this event. So we don't need to speculate. We can just show you what the police say. So this is the student for the listening audience. I would highly encourage you to come over to YouTube Rumble or X just to see visually how insane this is. So this is the 11 year old student and this is his arsenal, we'll call it, of pew pews, knives, weapons of all sorts, okay? And so, excuse me, did I just burp on the podcast? I'm so sorry, y'all. Um. It was like the babiest burp <laughs> So I don't even know why I said anything. I'm just so authentic. But anyway, um, this article goes on to say, detectives were alerted via a tip to Fortify Florida that the 11-year-old had made threats to conduct a pew-pewing and shown off several weapons in a video chat. This is with his peers. He also had a written list of people he claimed he would unalive. Well, I don't even want to get into how much you guys hate that video, so I will or how much you guys hate that word, so I'll stop saying it. But um, this police sheriff's overview, we'll call it, says, during a search of Carlo's room, detectives recovered a large amount of airsoft rifles, pistols, fake ammunition, along with knives, swords, and other weapons. The list was also recovered, the list of names. Carlo indicated the threat was a joke. He was taken into custody and transported to the Volusia Family Resource Center for Processing prior to transport to the Department of Juvenile Justice, so fully arrested. The sheriff in Volusia County, where this took place, he put out a statement saying, every time we make an arrest, your kid's photo is going to be put out there. We're going to get you. We're going to put you out for public embarrassment. For the little bastards out there who think this is funny, you want to get on social media, you ain't that smart, you're getting caught. Now, something about these comments doesn't sit right with me. I think there's a difference between being a strong police officer or a strong sheriff and being a total prick whose prickness actually taunts kids into doing the opposite of what was intended. It kind of gave me this weird feeling that this police officer had like tiny dick syndrome. It's the equivalent of somebody revving their massive truck engine near you. It's just like, it's not cool. It's kind of lame. And I think that statements and actions like this from the police department, I'll get into this. I think that this will scare straight the kids who are already scared straight by authority, but 11 year old boys 
who have a propensity to dislike authority probably think that a video like this and a statement like this from the police officer where this guy's this kid is probably going to get out and everything it is going to make this kid a legend it's going to make him awesome and if we know anything about mass assaults we'll call them one of the top beliefs among psychologists as to why mass shooters do this is to create notoriety for themselves but these kids or these actions towards this kid just create notoriety for the kid so i think a a no tolerance a no bullshit strategy is great but the implementation of it here i found to be way off and i know a lot of people are not going to agree with me but i want to pull up the video so you guys can watch it so this is kind of where the real controversy is it's not even in the sheriff's comments it's it stems from a video of the 11 year old boy being perp walked and then posted by the local sheriff so let's watch that all right sir careful as you can you're gonna be walking over here to this the gate over here all right slow and steady what you here for today Put that foot down, let me get the other foot. All right, come on in here, have a seat in the cell. We're gonna gather up some paperwork and get things started for you. Do you have any questions? No, All right. There are some people who love this video. There are some people who hate this video. I think there's valid criticism to the video but i also realize that most of the people who are hating this video online specifically hate it because the evil republican state of florida is enacting it not because they're actually opposed to being hard on serious crimes like maybe i am but personally i think this video was taken to help either the ego or the political circumstances of a local sheriff so he could seem tough. I'm not saying that what Florida did in preemptively stopping this kid or arresting this kid, you know what, I have no problem with any of that. In fact, I think we need more of that, more of this tough on crime narrative, more of this tough on crime action, right? This kid should not have access to firearms. He should be on watch lists that exist. I'm cool with he, him being punished to the fullest extent of the law for even joking about something so catastrophic and life altering. I also think the videotaping of a child going to jail will live on the internet forever now. And I don't think it was done solely to admonish this kid. It was to, it was done to politically assist a sheriff and it gives me the ick. The intention with interventions should be, in my opinion, not only to stop this action, not only to prevent others from taking similar actions, but to set, if it's happening to children, set kids up for success and not for failure in the future. Posting videos on the internet isn't just embarrassing, as the sheriff insinuated, it's life ruining. If you're going to perp walk anyone for embarrassment, do it to the parents. They have a fully developed prefrontal cortex and they gave their kids those weapons. But yeah, I just don't think that's right. I Something about it gave me the ick. It felt off. I wouldn't be surprised if there was a scandal that was going to come out about this Florida sheriff and he was just trying to get ahead of it. I don't know. You guys let me know whether you agree with me or please respectfully why you disagree. And please tell me why more than just I disagree. I, I like to hear all your thoughts, okay? But speaking of disagreement, I got a decent amount of pushback online last week when I aptly, correctly, look at me, I'm doing my Donald Trump hand, correctly clarified that in Springfield, Ohio, the consumption of animals, as we'll say, from Haitian migrants is partially true and partially false. I get it. People want the story to be true because let's be honest, it's politically convenient. But as I pointed out, we're a show based in truth and there was not evidence that migrants were eating pets, okay? There is evidence that migrants could possibly be consuming geese and ducks at parks, but geese and ducks are different from household pets, okay? But I have more reporting on this story. I'm not gonna go back and rehash my very correct reporting, okay? I have more to report on this story. So over the weekend, I heard on X 
that Donald Trump's comments about the Haitian migrants in Springfield at the presidential debate had perpetuated bomb threats on schools and the community. And when I heard this, I just got to say, my bullshit radar went into full action. It went wee woo, wee woo, wee woo. I just, flags were up for me because let's be honest, what is the motivation to target little Ohio kids in a public school because Trump talked about Haitian migrants in a debate. That makes no sense to me. And the media loves this. They love to talk about this. Anytime a conservative comment or anytime, this isn't even just about the Springfield story. It's about any of these stories, anytime a conservative has a single comment on something real that's happening, like what's happening in Springfield, the media will look for a fake bomb threat and then call up the conservative who dared to comment on a fact or a story and ask them why they incited a bomb threat. They do this all the time. The media loves to do this to Haya Rychik. She's the face of this very popular X account called Libs of TikTok. All she does is she'll post something about a hospital that's doing surgeries on minors, and then the hospital has a hoax of a bomb threat, and then the media calls up high and is like, why did you start a bomb threat? It's like, the hell, I was just reporting. So it's very interesting, but let's look at some of the media coverage of this alleged bomb threat in Ohio real quick. So we'll start off with none other than Lester Holt, who said on his show that political violence in Springfield, Ohio is being linked to Donald Trump. He said today's apparent assassination attempt, this is the the second assassination attempt on Donald Trump, by the way, he's referencing to, he says, today's apparent assassination attempt comes amid increasingly fierce rhetoric on the campaign trail itself. Mr. Trump, his running mate, J.D. Vance, continue to make baseless claims about Haitian immigrants in Springfield, Ohio. This weekend, there were new bomb threats in that town. We have CBS News' Nora O'Donnell claiming that Trump is the real source of violent rhetoric. Donald Trump is blaming Democrats for inflaming political rhetoric, but the former president's own words seem to be increasing the threat of political violence in Springfield, Ohio. That's where a false and ugly accusation against Haitians is impacting everyday life. And then they you know, sent it out to a reporter to talk about the bomb threats. USA Today also lamenting that Trump correctly pointed out Democrats' use of inflammatory language, quote, while he sits idly by as Springfield, Ohio suffers bomb threats and school evacuations over his outrageous and racist lies about legal Haitian immigrants. Oh, do, 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 do. Let's just scroll up the page. Oh, the Republican governor, Mike DeWine, confirmed that all 33 bomb threats made were hoaxes. None of them had any validity at all. We have people, unfortunately, overseas who are taking these actions, he added. Some of them are coming from one particular country, aka there is political interference coming from our foreign adversaries to put in bomb hoaxes at public schools in Ohio because they know it will gin up political discourse and the media is falling for it. It's wild. The media gets all pissy that Republicans are stoking a hoax and then they try to rectify the problem by stoking a hoax. I don't know, guys. I think this is a good idea. How about you just do your damn research and let the truth guide you? It's a really simple idea, you know? I'm a one-woman show over here and I managed to get it done. And then when I mess up on the facts, I just apologize and give the facts. It's just, it's not that hard. But I want to move on to our second part of this Springfield, Ohio story, because I want to discuss the data that has come out following this influx of migrants into the area. It shows that shoplifting and vehicle thefts have grown exponentially since Haitian migrants started coming into the city, which, by the way, I will say was already a cesspool for crime before the Haitians, but it's still interesting. And if you're looking for real information to combat the border crisis, this is a much better place to start, I believe, than the narrative about cats and dogs. This report coming to us from the Daily Color News Foundation says reports of shoplifting and vehicle theft increased considerably in Springfield following the arrival of thousands of Haitian refugees. The town, which has a population of 
58,622 in 2020, has taken in between 12,000 and 20,000 Haitian refugees over the past three years, marking a population increase of between 20 and 34 percent. That is a huge change in the population makeup of this town. And then between 21 and 23, so in just two to three years, Springfield also saw a 51% jump in motor vehicle theft reports and and 112% spike in reports of shoplifting. This is according to the Springfield Police Division. Springfield residents also told the Daily Caller News Foundation that the influx of Haitians has resulted in an uptick in car accidents. We've addressed this on this show before. It has also caused an increase in housing prices, prices and strained public services. Springfield city manager has sent a letter to two of the Republican senator or two of the senators, including Republican Ohio Senator J.D. Vance, as well as Democratic Ohio Senator Sherrod Brown. And for some reason, South Carolina Senator Tim Scott, I, I find that to be odd, but maybe there's a reason. But this town has put in requesting for federal assistance to deal with the pressure migrant ha migrants have placed on the housing supplies. Inhabitants of the town also told the DCNF, that's the Daily Caller News Foundation, that they had observed Haitians engaging in SEGS acts and other vices in public. Obviously, we are unable to verify every single one of these residents kind of gripes with what's going on and gripes about public debauchery, but it is very interesting. Mind you, Springfield's police department has not crime... De has not commented on the crime data, which doesn't include information about immigration status or demographics of offenders. So it is very possible at the same time, I just want to give you all the possibilities, that these spikes that we're seeing because Haitians have come in and caused an, up an increase in housing prices, strained public services, had all these increased accidents, that it's actually the Americans in this town who are engaging in more crime because they can't afford houses, they are in more car accidents, they're put in a financial or uh, otherwise maybe a medical situation. So we don't want to just blame these statistics solely on the Haitian migrants. But what we can tell is that there is an uptick in all of these negative things since there has been an, a massive influx of refugees into the area. Now you know all the information about this story, and as you can tell, it's still logical to come to the conclusion that the border crisis is to blame for these problems in Springfield, Ohio. So it's why I get frustrated and kind of annoyed with the GOP. It's like, just tell the truth. Just tell the truth, like myself, the Federalist, the Daily Caller News Foundation. If your truth is the truth, then it can stand up to logic and facts. And speaking of logic and facts, the best way to support this show is to support my merch line, Based. Based is the opposite of woke. It means you're based in logic, based in facts, and based in truth. All of those are the core tenets of my mission, Why I Started Underreported Stories. And if you love watching or listening to the show, please consider supporting and getting, getting a dope-ass hat with it, yeah? You can get your merch at basedinlogicapparel.com or check out the show notes for more information. Okay, moving on. We are living in an alternate universe, like I said at the beginning of this show, because CNN is fact-checking Kamala Harris. And last week, we did this whole thing about how CNN was doing actual journalism, and then this week, they're doing an actual fact-check. And I'm just like, what in the world is going on here? It's crazy. But for real, the Kamala campaign has this X account called Kamala HQ, and it has a tendency to clip parts of either Trump or J.D. Vance's media appearances and then take them out of context and then post the out of context portion of the clip like it's facts when it's not. So the Daily Wire compiled a list of some of the CNN fact checks that were worth kind of observing and reading. So here's CNN or the Daily Wire kind of via CNN and everything, but they have this fact checker named Daniel Dale who actually delivered an entire eight part takedown of Kamala HQ's X account. And like I kind of said, they, the Kamala X account does this really weird rapid response lying about what is happening in videos. So I'm going to pull up instance by instance, but in this instance, Kamala HQ said, Trump, would that be okay, North Carolina? He's in Pennsylvania. And 
even Twitter or X or whatever you want to call it has flagged this and said the media in this is presented out of context. And when you watch the full video, Donald Trump is not confused whether he's in Pennsylvania or in North Carolina. He sees North Carolinians in the crowd and he goes, is that okay with you? And he's pointing at them, you North Carolina. He's, he knows what he's talking about, of course. And then they do this in the same vein here. Trump, Pennsylvania, remember when you remember this when you have to go vote? He's in Arizona. Okay, well, in this clip, if you watch it in the entirety, not just the snippet that Kamala HQ clipped, you'll see that what Donald Trump was actually saying is he was talking about Pennsylvania's migrant crisis while at an Arizona rally, and he looks to the camera and he says, Arizona, remember the the migrant crisis that you're facing when you do this. He's, he's just addressing a national audience. He wasn't confused about where he was. He was talking about something very specific, actually. They also do this. You saw this in the debate. You saw this online that Kamala HQ loves to say that Trump said that neo-Nazis chanting Jews will not, not replace us was Trump saying nothing was done wrong there. That's not true. If you listen to the entire context of this, of course, we know that that is completely false. There's also, this one is crazy. This one is of J.D. Vance. The question was, in an interview, would you consider privatizing veterans' health care? To which Vance actually responded, I think I'd consider, and Donald Trump is really good at this, doesn't get enough credit for this particular innovation, giving veterans more choice, right? So the full question is, question or answer is, I think I'd consider giving veterans more choice. And Kamala just clipped the part where he said, I think I'd consider privatizing veterans' health care. Out of context. Completely wrong. And this is just what the campaign does time and time again. And I want to give CNN props. I, I really do. But they shouldn't just be fact-checking Kamala 50 days before an election to feign being apolitical. If they would run legitimate fact checks against both candidates for the entirety of their presidencies or vice presidencies, I wouldn't have a problem. But obviously that's not the case. Otherwise it wouldn't be news. One fact check does not make up for years of being a Democratic simp. All right, CNN? Okay, time-wise, we got to move on. Next up, a university is finally sticking up for women. So it seems... Southern Utah University recently canceled a women's volleyball match against San Jose State University after it was uncovered that a player on San Jose State's women's team was born a biological male. This article coming to us from OutKick says, Southern Utah refuses to play San Jose State volleyball, which has a biological male on the team. So there's a tournament ongoing called the Santa Clara Tournament, and it's taking place this past week, and it took place this past weekend, and it featured four women's volleyball programs. Those schools include Southern Utah University, which we discussed, San Jose State University, which we discussed, Santa Clara, and Fresno State. One of the players named Blair Fleming on the San Jose State vo women's volleyball team has hidden the fact that the player was born as a biological male and plays on women's sports teams. So conveniently, Southern Utah was scheduled to play against San Jose State on Saturday, and the match was just canceled. Outkick reached out to Southern Utah to see why the match was not being played. The school kind of skirted it, saying, you know, our volleyball team has opted to compete in just two of these non-conference games at the tournament over the weekend. And then when Outkick kind of followed up and said, hey, was it because of this player? They just didn't respond on the specifics of why they would actually canceled the match. There is video footage of this volleyball player in action and I just want you to watch how high this player can jump and how hard the ball is hit. And making a run in that second set and maybe even the first. Here's Warden with the serve. The Spartans with a big kill. To clarify again, Southern Utah University did not explicitly state that it wouldn't be competing against San Jose State University because of that player Blair's involvement. I just think it's difficult to think why a school would yank itself from a single tournament game for any other reason. I understand that it's not convenient to admit that you're pulling the girls from a tournament for a reason that is, we'll say, politically incorrect to leftists. But do you think it's enough to just yank the team from the tournament? Like, shouldn't 
Should Southern Utah University have to explain its rationale here? Let me know what you think in the comments, because I definitely think that it's better they don't play and not given an explanation than to play at all, right? But I do wish that an explanation was given in hopes of further warding off men from competing in women's sports. That's really my goal here, but interested in hearing your reactions in the comments. Let's get to our final story. So a teacher was fired after answering a question that triggered a student. So the teacher's name is Ann Protopapas. She's a teacher with the elite all-girls school, Spence School. And in 2023, she was teaching at the time the head of school. Head of school's name is Felicia Wilkes. Felicia Wilkes' daughter was in Ann Protopapas' French class. So when the daughter got an answer to a question that she asked from the teacher that she didn't like, the student started screaming and crying in class And it all culminated in this teacher, Anne, being fired. The incident took place in May of 2023 when the daughter of Felicia Wilkes asked a question about France's so-called hijab laws, according to court papers. Wilkes, who is the head of school, was brought in as head of school earlier in the year as the school spent school grappled with a number of racial dust-ups. Now, Felicia Wilkes is, I want to say... She's Middle Eastern just based on looks, but of course, you know, don't want to be racist, don't want to get anything wrong. I'm going to presume that it's not a fact. Um, And the young Wilkes had asked in French class about a political, a very political question asking about France's hijab laws. Well, the New York Post does a really good job at explaining what those hijab laws are. So in 2022, France... Well, actually, for a long time, France has had restrictions on wearing religious symbols deemed ostentatious in school. So that's Christian crosses, yarmulkes, hijabs, etc. And then in 2022, they also banned women from wearing a hijab while competing in sports, a law that they relaxed for athletes at the Parisian Olympics. But the nation, France, specifically banned robe-like abbasses in schools. Both moves were met with strong opposition in the European nation and internationally. And so when the teacher was talking about this in Protopapas in Spent School, she said, you know, she was trying to connect it back to her lesson. And she said, the supporters of this ban believe it enforces France's tradition of secularism. She was just teaching facts. And Anne, the, the teacher, said that all of a sudden this younger, the young girl just started freaking out. She said that... The, the girl got intensely personal and emotional reaction that was hard for her to control. She was in a lot of pain. She was furious. She kept talking to her friends. The teacher said she'd never seen anything like this in her 40 years of teaching because these kids have gone absolutely nuts. They, they really have just lost their ever-loving minds. And then the next day, which was the last day of school for seniors, the younger Wilkes, so the head of school's daughter, expressed even more anger as if she had been inflamed and tried to get her classmates to join in her outrage, a move that left the teacher isolated in anger, or a move that let the student, sorry, isolated in anger, and the rest of the class just embarrassed and confused. Protopapas was then deemed harmful to students and Islamophobic. And so the teacher obviously tried to get in touch with the administration, with the head of school, and she was just denied. And because the head of school's daughter was triggered, the teacher is gone now. 25 years of dedication to the school, one student gets triggered and poof, her whole career is gone. I just don't think that should be allowed. It's cancel culture over a woke mind virus because someone teaches you facts. And I think that's why I was really adamant about this Springfield, Ohio story. It's why I'm so honest about giving my audience facts because if we no matter where we fall on the partisan spectrum, if we can't absorb facts that don't agree with our preconceptions and our biases, then it results in cancel culture, no matter which side of the political aisle you are on. So kudos to you for absorbing shows like this or like other shows where they just give you the facts and let you make your own decisions. And maybe they give you a take or two. Like I absolutely give my honest opinions here, but you know, it's really just about the facts. And if you love this show and my honest opinions, then please be sure to give this video a thumbs up, subscribe, especially if you're watching on YouTube, Rumble, or X. And if you're in the listening audience, be sure to give this video a five-star review. It's really helpful. But today's show is not done yet. We have a bonus story and my favorite game, is it real or is it satire? So 
let us start with our bonus story. As you guys know, I'm like a news junkie. It's like cracked me in the morning. Coffee, morning news gets me through my day. So I'm reading Politico this morning, which is one of the morning newsletters I read to stay abreast on liberal politics and whatnot. And so I wanted to read and discuss what I read in Politico this morning because it was just so interesting to me. So it reads, Democrats have spent much of the 2024 campaign reminding Americans of what happened on January 6th, 2021. But on Capitol Hill, some are already getting worried about January 6th, 2025. Now, by Capitol Hill, I would assume and insinuate that um, that means everybody on Capitol Hill, not just the left. But no, by this, of course, because of Politico's insane political bias, they have already slanted it to the left, saying they, meaning liberals, leftists, Democrats, whatever word you want to use, Democrats are hoping that Harris will win in November and they'll flip the House too, meaning it would likely be Hakeem Jeffries, who is their minority leader, holding the Speaker's gavel as the process of certifying a Harris victory gets underway. But it's another scenario that is nagging House Democrats, that Speaker Mike Johnson might keep his majority as Harris wins, which is very possible, and find himself in a position where he could obstruct the counting of electoral votes and possibly throw the election to the House under the constitutional provision of the 12th Amendment. Now, this is a lot of jibber jabber to say that none of this could happen because votes get certified on Capitol Hill when the vice president whose job it is to certify the votes certifies votes right and of course it, we need the speaker of the house's assistance in all of this but it's ultimately up to mike pence or maybe in this case kamala harris who would be presiding over the election certification and if kamala is elected into office why would kamala obstruct anything it's it's interesting it's an interesting take it's really just i think they Politico didn't have anything to talk about this morning and said they needed to bring up January 6th because it's all they can talk about because they can't pull their heads out of their own asses. But it goes on to read, Johnson, after all, led House Republicans in filing an amicus brief after the 2020 election, asking the Supreme Court to essentially overturn swing state results, an effort personally blessed by Donald Trump. Now, Mike Johnson's leading a charge suggesting that undocumented immigrants are voting in mass. That's not what he's saying. And what Democrats view as a coordinated effort to sow doubt in the election and lay the groundwork for mischief. Um, Mike Johnson is not sowing doubt by saying that undocumented immigrants are voting. Um, you are sowing doubt, Mr. Democrats and Mrs. Democrats, by refusing to pass a bill that makes you show and prove that you are an American citizen in order to vote into our election. If you don't want to sow doubt about it, then just pass the bill, dipshits, okay? Next, I want to talk about Mike Johnson in all of this. I'm very curious from audience point of view, do you guys view him as part of the MAGA movement or do you really view him as part of the establishment? Because I've always viewed him as part of the establishment. And then Politico loves to do this thing where they're like, Republicans and MAGA hate Mike Johnson for being in the establishment. And now they're like, yeah, he's a right wing, oh, right wing MAGA, blah, blah, blah. So I think that's maybe the real reason why I wanted to bring this up is I want to solicit your opinions about Mike Johnson because I'm like, what the heck? Is he a, where do you guys view him? I view him as like a tolerable establishment candidate that knows how to politically operate in MAGA land because he understands what MAGA land entails and he agrees with most of it, but not all of it. But he also is smart enough to know that you can't get anything done without understanding the ins and outs of the establishment. So he's like a little bit of both. And I think in order to lead in Congress, you need to be both. So I don't think he's a bad character, but I am just curious to get my audience's thoughts. So if you could drop a comment or even email me, chrissy at underreportedstories.co, C-O, not com, okay? Feel free to email me. I'd love to hear your thoughts. Um, I, I will just say my final thoughts on this Axios, or not Axios, the Politico article. <laughs> what struck me as very funny about this is that nowhere in this article does it recognize what the real problem with January 6th was. It was like, maybe, hear me out, the capital storming part, not the fundamental disagreement with election certification. Because that was, that just struck me as odd. Like January 6th is a day that we remember consciously because of the capital incident, not because of the election certification delay that Democrats, by the way, have also previously advocated for in previous elections. So I think it's just absolute hackery to not maybe insinuate that Democrats won't attempt to review constitutional provisions 
if their preferred candidate isn't put in place too. I found this to be very odd and, and poor writing. When in fact, if you actually logically think about it, there would be more worry from the GOP because Kamala Harris is actually the one tasked with certifying the election. So should she lose, would she be the one trying to stall the certification of the election because she's the one that's directly impacted by this? I, I think that would be a really great line of questioning, but none of that got covered. So yay. <laughs> so dumb. But you guys are lucky because today's show is not done yet. And I don't know if it's about to get worse or better than the insanity that we read in Politico. But today we have an edition of Is It Real or Is It Satire? where we discuss stories that make us wonder, is this real or is this satire? Is it real or is it satire? You cannot be serious! The Teletubbies decided to attend a RuPaul's Drag Race convention, and I guess we're outing Tinky Winky as a drag queen now. Watch this weird video. <laughs> What is this? Teletrannies? <laughs> That's funny. Oh my gosh. I guess I was I was reading about this in the comments. It was like hella progressive back in the 1990s, 1997, because the creators of Teletubbies put Tinky Winky, who's apparently a dude, they gave Tinky Winky a purse. And now in 2024, we have to out Tinky Winky as a drag queen. Like what? And I, like I said, reading the comments in this video, it was just a bunch of cringy millennials in their 30s and 40s replying, Yas Queen, to this children's space alien character. It's fucking weird. It's weird that a kid's show from 97 has become a gay rights icon. Like, come on. I have no problem with gay people having gay icons. It's fucking weird, though, when the gay icon is a kid's show character, right? This is why we can't have nice things, because we take adorable, although creepy, little space aliens and turn them into activist icons for cringy millennials with arrested development, okay? So odd. But let me know your thoughts on the Teletrannies or the Teletubbies, whatever you want to call, uh, or whatever you want to call them. I, I just can't believe these words exit my mouth some days. So what the fuck? Ah! But anyway, if you're a real one and you stuck around until the end, will you drop the alien emoji to signify our real or satire segment about the Teletubbies? <laughs> anyway, thank you so much for tuning in and I'll see you guys here next time. Thanks so much for watching. If you liked what you heard, please be sure to give this video a thumbs up and leave a comment about how beautiful, stunning, and funny I am. And if you want more content based in logic, be sure to click over here for more videos and clips of my show. If you have the means to financially support the show, consider purchasing from my merch line, Based Apparel, linked right below. I really appreciate it, and I'll see you back here next time. Bye, friends.